hello everyone uh, uh, thanks for uh, uh, thanks to olga and uh, the management team for conducting this uh, wonderful conference uh, i was not able to attend the whole uh, uh, complete conference because it was mostly my uh, sleep time but uh, i did attend yesterday a few lectures and then today uh, i was able to attend uh, most of them so uh, that was really nice to hear from everyone uh, and that's really a good thing and thanks to olga for the honor uh, for presenting the this final talk uh, i'll be talking mostly uh, in the area of uh, prognostics and statistical health management uh, both from the perspective of model based uh, diagnostics and prognostics so which is the the key to uh, what we have been working on and uh, what is the next step or where are we heading based on the hybrid bits uh, based approaches uh, because that's something which is a new avenue uh, opening up and uh, there is a good amount of research being uh, started in that area uh, before going into the uh, the presentation i'd like to acknowledge uh, our, um, our team and also uh, collaborators so uh, from both uh, olga uh, manuel kai and uh, philippe from university of central florida so most of the work uh, I, i'll be citing them uh, in in the talk but that's the that's the key work uh, uh, the key people with whom i have been working with uh, just a brief uh, brief background of what uh, prognostics is so uh, basically we need to be adopting uh, to a, a different strategies or condition based strategies depending on what the <coughs> the state of health of the system is so it it need not be a time based uh, maintenance but it can be uh, based on what each system sees or each system observes and uh, we have to take decisions based on those uh, how do we optimally uh, optimally schedule those maintenance because uh, some of the systems they are uh, critical systems you cannot just shut them shut them down but if we know far off in the future we can take a decision as to when those specific systems could be brought down uh, uh, in a relatively easier manner and also we can save on the, the return of investment based on the cost required the manpower required and also uh, to optimize uh, how to uh, procure the spares for those so the components which may be required in the future that uh, someone knows uh, in, uh, up ahead that these are going to be affected or these are going to be replaced uh, those could be planned accordingly uh that's the maintenance part but then when the system is online or when the system is actually working uh you have to uh you cannot if you cannot shut down the system for example if it's a critical uh, plant which is working uh it's an aircraft or a, a uav which is working basically you cannot just uh, try to shut it down but then you can re uh, reconfigure the system uh, uh at at run time and then try to avoid the component before it uh, from feeling or try to avoid the loading on those components and that could lead that could be depending on the input uh, commands it could be the environment and uh, different loading conditions and how do you help in prolonging those components or by modifying uh, how the components are being used so uh, probably if it's it's a twin engine uh, uh, it, uh, there are four rotors or there are uh, an octocopter or there are some redundant devices uh, how can can those to uh, take the load and uh, try to get uh, to the end of the goal or end of the mission before then a decision could be taken to either replace them <coughs> or uh, to be um, updated based on what the the fault or the the health situation was and then to optimally plan uh, or replan any mission which may be part of it so uh, if it's an online um, process or if it's an online mission which is continually going how can you replan it and going forward uh, so the replan can be done both uh, um, uh, it can be optimized in a uh, different ways and one of the examples would be uh, the the airspace as we uh, see uh, with the advent of uam so uh, this would be an airspace as uh, as nasa has been uh, looking at or uh, that's what uh, we we uh, perceive that would be the airspace in the future where you have will have uh, fleets of vehicles which are moving uh, from uh, one one uh, small city to another and those are basically in the the urban areas and when you have such kind of fleets which are a mixed of uh, different vehicles and as well as 
they are part of an urban environment, safety becomes very critical because uh, there is uh, it's close to uh, basically the population of the human population. Uh, it's not like an uh, an aircraft or a passenger aircraft which is flying like 25 or 30 thousand feet. But these are close uh, small city uh, hops, basically what we can say, and they will be flying basically where around there is a lot of uh, human population uh, being uh, traveling out on the ground and uh, keeping that airspace safe would be a very critical thing so for example if you are flying uh, if you have a basic route and if during the flight you observe that probably the state of charge of the uh, battery the state of health of the pack uh, seems to be uh, going down so what do you do because there is no uh, much landing space available uh, but based there is based on what the fault is or what the the prediction says or what the estimate says for how much charge is left in the on the system you can take the the system uh, or the pilot either ways can take a decision that probably it need not go to the <clears throat> for this point uh, 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 at the outside, but it can take a shorter route, and that could make the trip complete. So it can do those uh, calculations up front, um, and then get give a feedback uh, for the decision maker or to the pilot, uh, saying that okay, probably I, I need to miss that route. Uh, we can still make it to the uh, other two points, and then get back to the home uh, home base safely. And uh, these uh, the example was uh, for the for the battery because that's something what our work is but it can be applied to anything it could be uh, some weather condition which is occurring in between or there's unsafe airspace uh, which may be the issue so <coughs> uh, these these can uh, be uh, tackled differently but the overall uh, uh, framework would remain the same in that case uh, to use uh, to implement these type of frameworks the current state of the heart are uh, Two key things. One, the first one is a model-based uh, uh, framework, so uh, which is uh, looks into the physics part of it. So uh, th those results uh, uh, tend to be intuitive. So model-based, uh, uh, physics-based models are intuitive, and which are based on the first principle. So when when they are not, uh, they are still. Uh, Instructive, so that means uh, the underlying modeling effects, which if unmodeled uh, based on the fidelity of the model, uh, those can be captured uh, uh, as part of the the physics model. Uh, physics models uh, mainly can be reused because uh, the, if if at at any point of time you have a, a model of a motor or a, an actuator, the, the the framework still remains the same, but uh, the parameters could be tuned in and out. Uh, based on what type of uh, component or what type of fleet uh, uh, it has been used on, so uh, that's the that's the uh, what we can say a very good part of it or the beauty of the uh, physics mass model is it takes uh, it can be uh, generalized as uh, as much as possible uh, and if incorporated uh, correctly or if incorporated early in the design process uh, then. Uh, you can drive some requirements because if we know that uh, it's being it's going to be implemented on a certain system or component, uh, sensors could be placed uh, accordingly, and those sensors uh, could be used or those sensors could be used, uh, uh, be enough to evaluate the health of the system over this period of time. Uh, but there are uh, surely uh, several drawbacks to it because. Uh, Model-based developments it requires a thorough understanding of the system. Uh, it has to be uh, the the physics has to be known. So the modeling takes a, a lot of time. And uh, in case the systems are complex, then <coughs> that becomes a bit difficult to uh, model as you keep on uh, adding complex systems uh, and interaction with each other. And also, high fidelity models can be uh, computationally intensive. So something where you have to have an online uh, estimation or uh, online uh, uh, prediction for the health of the system or the, the, the component, then it becomes difficult to make those uh, computationally uh, viable when they are on board. So uh, then in that case, you have to uh, move to a newer fidelity models, but still, uh, how can you efficiently uh, get better results out of it so that's that's the key for it and uh, we have tried to implement that in uh, different areas <clears throat> uh, 
so uh, some of the examples are uh, the the crack growth model the taylor model corrosion uh, the aberration model so these are some of the models what um, many of you must have seen and uh, for uh, in in applying this with this phase models uh, you know, per se uh, in your research work and then the next one comes is the data driven models so these are uh, the ones what um, most of you and uh, what we have seen through the stocks uh, during the, the period i've seen like a lot of uh, a lot many researchers have used the, the data driven models or the, the machine learning what we uh, now uh, are being emphasizing on so they are relatively uh, easy uh, to implement based because uh, there are different packages which could be used so at the starting point they give a good push to uh, start something which where there is a lot of unknown things about the system itself so the data can help in uh, identifying or at least uh, getting uh, some things uh, connected to uh, the model or uh, based on the data getting more information out of it uh, it identifies uh, it helps in identifying the relationships that were not previously considered and also uh, consider all relationships without any prejudice so uh, there is there is a good uh, indication for that but again um, the, it requires a lot of data and a, a good balanced approach so most of the time uh, the run to failure data is not available and also in some of the talks from uh, yesterday for the, the vehicle health information uh, during the discussion it came up that uh, if the if there are a lot of data gaps or uh, no data is available then it becomes difficult to uh, tackle that problem so uh, or, or uh, have some uh, um, issues or uh, difficulty in making predictions so that's that's a uh, very key to it and uh, that's what uh, the, the drawbacks could be and also um, there is high risk of overlearning the data uh, and conversely there is also a risk of over generalizing based on how what type of data it is or what type of data has been collected uh, during uh, during the um, the process uh, these can be computationally intensive so both from the point of analysis and implementation so at times it becomes difficult to implement uh, these type of models for an online uh, scenario specifically what we talked earlier where you have uh, these vehicles which are flying <coughs> so that uh, that has to be taken uh, um, considered during implementing such kind of models. Um, and then uh, everyone has an idea that these could be uh, neural nets, regressions, uh, Bayesian frameworks, and RVMs. Uh, since um, we were more focused, uh, the, as a group, we are more focused on the, the boundary-based prognostics, uh, the physics-based modeling. Uh, uh, I'll just go through a couple of slides uh, showing the framework, what we have been using, or what, what uh, approach we have been using. So uh, the model-based uh, system, it looks into the underlying physics uh, using a suitable uh, representation. And uh, these are derived from the first principle. So you have uh, which en encapsulate the laws of physics. So that could be your uh, differential equations. Uh, it could be uh, Lagrange equation. So basically, whatever will define the the underlying physics for that specific system or uh, component that is being looked at. Uh, empirical models, uh, they are chose, uh, chosen based on the understanding of the uh, dynamics of the system. So uh, in case uh, the system is complex or something is not um, known about the system or there is uh, some um, details which are not available then in that case uh, a lump parameter model or a classical first order response uh, curves could be used and then there is another uh, the next step where you have uh, the the finite element models and high fidelity simulation models but again as i talked earlier that those are something uh, which again have a uh, drawback from the online point of view so we have been <coughs> emphasizes only on the first part where we look into pds and uh, uh, equations. So uh, there's a basic static uh, vector which includes both the dynamics of under both nominal and degradation process. So uh, you can have that equation, and uh, uh, then we uh, have our uh, filtering framework where it does an estimation for the health of state, and then the RU computation. So the, the filtering framework is used for the estimation part, and then uh, the rest of the part uh, where you have uh, 
the the health state and the forecasting part it's purely model based so it's a monte carlo simulation and uh, depending on how well the model is you will have uh, a, a good PDF basically mentioning that okay, how, what is my uncertainty around it uh, and how does it change over the period of time. Uh, the EOLs, they basically are defined on the performance uh, and uh, variable. So it, it is uh, all depending on the user or uh, system what is being used for. And that can be set uh, as um, at the threshold. So what, whenever it crosses that threshold, uh, the system is considered failed, but that's something down the line. <coughs> so very uh, short schematic of what exactly would happen in such conditions is uh, in case a component is taken, you have a component uh, will have accelerated aging and uh, will have a degradation modeling based on uh, those uh, aging components. And that keeps an update or we, we are able to update the model uh, as more and more data is collected or uh, to validate the model and then the, the later part so that is the offline part but then the state space representation and the parameter estimation uh, those are the ones which can be done online so once the model is ready uh, as we get more data or uh, as we keep on updating the system uh, we are able to then make predictions so based both on the health state estimation as well as the remaining useful life so remaining useful life if you take a, a, a lithium ion battery, for example, then in that case, an RUL estimation would be for that specific charge cycle, but then health state would be over the period of several cycles. So it would be like hundreds or 200 cycles what the battery may go through. So uh, the, the framework is able to uh, make estimates for both. So during that specific cycle, as well as for the health state over the period of its operational life. And, uh, <clears throat> The estimates, uh, if you take for the cycle, uh, these are for the, the health state are uh, based on a different uh, time frame. So the tracking health uh, that's based on uh, measurements which are done. So measurements can be done at uh, different instances. So at times you will have uh, very high uh, frequency sensors or high uh, data acquisition systems. So you can do measurements at probably one hertz or less than that, more than that, depending on how, how the system is. Uh, but the overall uh, goal is that you keep on updating uh, the inputs and uh, keep on forecasting them. So in this case, probably at initial stages, uh, the very top plot uh, shows that uh, the time to failure is around 116 hours. But then as uh, it gets additional information or more information, the model is able to make a prediction which says that um, the the time to failure is close to 160 hours so it all depends on uh, how the model is behaving or how that component has been behaving over the period of time and that will completely change uh, the the remaining useful life because it it doesn't just do an estimate uh, or a prediction for one step but it keeps on doing that uh, at several uh, instances uh, during that period of the operational cycle of the of the uh, component of the system. Let me see my computer is frozen. Uh, I should be okay. Let's, let's see. Yeah. So, uh, once once we know what we uh, what we are looking at uh, the the next part is the model development part so uh, the the algorithm and the model development uh, uh, is looked from the trl point of view so trl is the uh, technology readiness level uh, from the nasa perspective uh, paradigm but it it looks at the same thing so trl1 is basically a basic principle observed and reported so it's uh, it's a very at the very low level understanding the system. So we want to know what the system is doing, uh, what are the key uh, operational conditions or the operating factors, uh, understanding how they work, and then trying to uh, build models around it. And then as we go up in the TRL level, we we, we are able to see uh, what uh, in make improvements. And that could be based on uh, knowledge uh, which we gain uh, through experiments or field data or try to uh, update the model if a new uh, operational factor or an operational uh, 
avenue is observed through through the, the learning process so tra2 is basically a concept and uh, an application formulated and then that goes up till tra9 where actual system is like a flight flight uh, readiness uh, for the, the success of the mission basically so uh, it uh, we as a group uh, we don't directly uh, work on high trls we are a very low trl as a group uh, <coughs> so we may go up till like trl three or four where we actually are able to prove that concept uh, uh, in the lab and then try to implement it on a vehicle. So uh, we have been, uh, we have gone through TRL uh, four or five based on uh, how, how we see that, but uh, five goes to like uh, testing in an environment. So uh, we, we have quoted some of our algorithms on board vehicles uh, on uh, some of the uh, unmanned vehicles or UAVs or um, other type of systems. So uh, that's that's the range what uh, our, our research goes up. And then at that point, uh, the research is transferred to uh, the, the project team and then they, they take it forward depending on how, how it, it's implemented. Uh, now coming back to uh, what physics-based models are and uh, what um, making a comparison between the two. And, uh, it has been observed that uh, there is always a need to have a, a both a, a physics underlying physics model because uh, these models are developed with a varying level of granularity. Like you can go to a very detailed structure of, a, of the aircraft. Uh, there is weight vortex, so weight vortex is also very complicated. But then you have uh, these um, uh, lithium batteries. Uh, so the the there is a wide range of uh, different systems, or uh, there is a wide range of different applications. What uh, we try to work on, and uh, at times it can be difficult to develop uh, the complex interactions. So uh, there is a requirement that if you need to have fast predictive models, or if there is uh, on something which is required for health monitoring, then they have to have uh, less. Uh, uh, level of granularity because we have to put them on some of these vehicles so the, the that there is a balance required between how much uh, model can be ported on that uh, under the research consensus and the key thing what we have observed is uh, most of the time when we implement some of these uh, uh, algorithms they always sit at as at the back because the the main the main key feature or the key <clears throat> requirement of any mission is to perform its, its mission requirements. So those could be a science missions, uh, any specific way doing some uh, medical uh, uh, rescue thing sort of thing. So th those are their, their front end requirements. So the, we always are uh, have a certain amount of limited computational power which is allocated. And uh, so whenever we are developing this physics models, uh, we look at conservation of mass, momentum, and then depending on what type of models it are, uh, they, they are available. So those could be high fidelity multi physics models. Uh, we can use experimental data from different studies. And then on the other side of the spectrum is the, 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 the data, data driven models or the machine learning models. So these require uh, large, uh, unbiased, and inclusive, good quality data. But is there a, a way to make a connection between them? Can we take uh, can we take the good from both the sides? Or uh, because machine learning models are uh, they can run in an autonomous mode, or they they can keep on learning if uh, there is a stream of data fed. And uh, physics learning models. So can we learn some of that physics, uh, uh, taking the, the the benefits of machine learning? And there are a lot of commercial uh, machine learning tools which are available, and uh, they typically do not require any use of physics, but uh, uh, they they do have a very uh, great development on uh, the, the learning capability. So the, over the period of time, that was bound to happen because both uh, as independent uh, uh, approaches, both have been working perfectly fine and very great results have been achieved over the period of time through uh, these methods. But uh, it can be done in either way. So you either learn the, if there's a model which is uh, available, uh, 
uh, we can learn and run physics through some machine learning and uh, the uh, vice versa could also be possible where there is a data available and trying to uh, extract some of the complex uh, uh, understanding of the physics and uh, putting it that in 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 the perspective of in uh, in the model based uh, scenario and uh, that's what we talk like that could be a level of fidelity basically where you have a very high fidelity model probably we can have it developed over the period of time and uh, then uh, it can be left to the autonomous system or the autonomous learning part where certain parameters if you know that these are the ones which are degrading or these are the ones uh, which are getting affected due to operation those can be learned over the period of uh, the operational cycle uh, how do we get there or how do we uh, try to uh, optimize uh, uh, this this level of uh, combination of this uh, approach so uh, providing an underlying physics base uh, to the digital fabric uh, would be a, 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 a very uh, good approach, but we can also use physics to reduce the ML problem. So machine learning has their own uh, uh, drawbacks. So uh, if can we uh, try to uh, reduce those uh, and then introduce some physics to it and the physics aspect to it instead of just a, a black box or not, uh, not having to know what what's happening internally uh, that that fusion would be a good one so uh, digital models with only physics and experiment data uh, would be a starting point and then managing the overall model evolution uh, as new data comes in so as and when we keep on getting new data we can learn uh, those underlying aspects of it or the underlying uh, phenomena what are part of the model and uh, can we guide the, the physics analysis and experiments to reduce the uncertainty in unknown areas? So there would be certain um, areas where we may not be able to uh, get the data, uh, which are the extreme data. So those uh, those uh, areas could be covered by the physics model. So there is a regime of data available in the operational uh, uh, condition, and the, but some of the extremes may not be available uh, for the data. And, the physics could cover that. So and that's a very good, uh, I think, so blend of the two uh, methods. <coughs> so how do we uh, blend them? Uh, is there, a, is there a, a single approach or is there one way to do it? Uh, probably not because uh, every user, uh, every application has a different requirement. So depending on where we uh, uh, we fit the the models or where we fit this uh, approaches, uh, there could be a different ways in which uh, we, we we could be able to uh, have them or implement them. Uh, just as an example, so I took a few examples uh, what have been uh, what we have been studying and uh, there there uh, have been more than this, but I thought these some of the examples what uh, in the, these slides uh, would be. Uh, something which uh, started that uh, that uh, process. So uh, in uh, 2005, Roche and the the, the team from uh, from his team uh, they did a feature engineering which is carried out for the residual between Kalman filter estimates and sensor readings, and that was used as an input to an SVN classifier. So and the residual based approach are standard for model based diagnostics of uh, specifically for aircraft engines and a generic residual based diagnostic approach uh, uh, it involves two major tasks so the first one is uh, to find the discrepancies between measurements and the expected uh, healthy model response uh, which are computed and in the second stage the residuals encode the potential uh, the impact of a degraded or faulty system behavior and those are processed with uh, a fault detection and isolation logic so uh, to create a, a diagnosis output so that was one uh, uh, of the, the avenues. So you can have uh, that as a system model and a, a, a common filter. Uh, in a, and, uh, okay, so it's uh, hopefully it should be back. Seems it doesn't like me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's okay. But uh, the next uh, one, uh, uh, it'll come up. Yeah, sorry. So, so the next one uh, is from Hanachi. Uh, that was a, a very recent one uh, where actually uh, they use a parallel hybrid approach to diagnostics of uh, gas turbines. 
So in this approach, uh, there is an empirical or a, a empirical model which is data driven, and uh, for for fault uh, transition models and a physics based uh, system model performs the state assessment. Uh, to aggregate the diagnostic results from uh, measurement signals and uh, degradation model, and they were using a particle filter. And uh, uh, this was the uh, we uh, took an approach for uh, deep learning plus physics model calibration. So this work was done uh, with uh, Olga and Manuel uh, and her uh, in uh, last year. So uh, this was a, a system model calibration. So in in this case, uh, the model calibration is an inverse uh, problem aiming to obtain values of model parameters uh, that make the system response follow uh, certain observations. And since both the measurement and the uh, measurement data and the model parameters are uncertain, the process of estimating uh, optimal uh, correcting parameters is uh, stochastic uh, for the calibration system. So uh, this was uh, a very good uh, approach what we took and we were able to implement that on some of the the, the examples for the CMAPS and I'll show that. Uh, so the deep learning uh, prognostic model receives an input uh, the scenario uh, descriptor uh, based on the operating conditions we have W and then the, the sensor readings, uh, the virtual sensors. And then the feedback arrow basically uh, um, represents the calibration so process me? for updating unobservable model parameters. Uh, and uh, the the calibration policy basically was implemented on CMAPS uh, engine data, where uh, we were able to identify the parameters of the physics-based model uh, that are intended to uh, calibrate. So looking into what parameters need to uh, be calibrated. Uh, create a neural network that models the complex system dynamics and then train and control the policy using the physics based model uh, of the uh, the DNN network. So uh, how do we train that and uh, implement a control policy around it? How do we weight ourselves? So uh, do we, uh, based on the model granularity, uh, if the decision has to be done, on board or uh, what's the computational cost and uh, if, if it's real time then probably physics models have a higher weightage and that's why we can use into looking into the model calibration or the physics guided machine learning part and uh, if there is a, uh, a data wide data of spectrum available and uh, which can be done in an offline or um, uh, in in cases where the computational cost is not uh, of that uh, criticality, so in that case we can use the residual based uh, diagnostic approaches or the prognostic approaches, and these approaches can be used to develop the, the empirical models. And so it's a it's a mix of things. It depends on, as I said, you can balance the weight based on what is required, and uh, you can tune the the approach based uh, uh, for it. So uh, in conclusion, um, uh, prognostics, it enables to make the system safe and uh, efficient, and it is key for giving a, uh, an output to the decision maker so that the, uh, based on which the decision maker can take the right decision. So uh, the framework gets completed when a decision maker is part of it because uh, prognostics is just an estimation of how the system is behaving, but then the decision maker, maker will complete that loop. Uh, going with the hybrid approaches, yes, physics-based methods uh, are important, but when they are combined with uh, machine learning, uh, we can evaluate uh, more complex systems and uh, we can take input from this high fidelity uh, simulation models or fields and test data and then use that uh, to learn it over the period of time. So I think uh, that blending is very important and that's very key. Uh, these models uh, will enable in uh, both verification and validation for autonomy because autonomy is, uh, is something what uh, uh, the, the goal of these machines or these vehicles is going towards and uh, doing that in a shorter period of time is key because the current methods take a longer time. Uh, you have to do tests, uh, you have to learn or develop these models. But can we reduce that time cycle or can we reduce that uh, cycle? So that's, that's something uh, very much uh, important and I think hybrid approaches would take that uh, that route and uh, I think we are in a in a uh, in a phase where this is the, another dimension to uh, the community uh, for looking into the research and uh, with availability of test and field data we will be able to uh, blend the digital data fabric for model update uncertainty quantification is uh, very much a part of it and uh, it needs to be uh, uh, included uh, into the 
the whole approach and we have been working on that uh, so that's that's also key and then framework is still in early stages we have done some tests but those have not flown or those have not been implemented at as i was talking about the trl level so we need to get up in the trl level and then get a feedback on the requirements for uh, autonomous system so i think that is the key uh, if we want to implement such kind of uh, approaches or where we, uh, we are able to blend them how do we take them or how do we uh, adapt to the requirements of the autonomous systems so uh, with that i'll i'll, I'll conclude uh, sorry my mic is not uh, my speaker is not working but i hope uh, uh, you had uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, please uh, uh, you can contact me or uh, uh, we can talk later so thank you so much